my message tonight. You're on a journey. So shake it off. Amen. Did anybody ever have that uh, class exercise at school where you did this kind of thing? Did it do you any good? No. It didn't do me one bit of good, you know? I thought that was the dumbest thing you could do. Check it off, check it off, you know? <laughs> but I do want you to study something with me tonight that I think will bless us all. And I want to go, first of all, to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43. Turn over there with me. I want to read a couple of verses there. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to read verse 18 and 19. But now, thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob. Now, I like the fact that it said, O Jacob, here instead of O Israel. Now, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, okay? But the beauty of this is that every time you read about Jacob, it's, it's, a, re, it's a reference to us also, okay? So everybody say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. How? Blessed. According to the word, in Jesus' name, that means in the character of Jesus. You are blessed in the character of Jesus. Thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name, your mind. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God. Verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Did anybody beside me have a hard time getting away from your past? Did anybody have a problem? I know I'm the only one that probably did this, but did anybody have a problem with a video of your past keep playing over and over and over in your head? We need to renew our minds. Yes. Yes. Our spirit been taken care of. Mm -hmm. We need to renew our minds. I want you to go with me now to the book of Acts. To an exciting episode in the life of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, my goodness alive, he went through a lot of things. He said, I have learned to be content in whatever state I am in. But in Acts chapter 28, we find him on his way to Rome. It was God's will for Paul to go to Rome. I'm glad he did. We're all blessed because of it. But one of the things that happened, and I preached uh, not too long ago a sermon about the shipwreck, but I want to look at something different tonight. Chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. Now when they had escaped from the ship, the storm had smashed the ship, the ship's coming apart. There's 287 people on this ship. Some of them were prisoners, some of them were army soldiers, and some of them were Navy guys. And God had told Paul, if everybody stays put and do what you tell them to do, then they're gonna all be saved. So Paul did his best to get the message across to the guys and everybody got on shore alive. Everything else was lost, but they were saved. And when they had escaped, they found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives 
showed us unusual kindness. They kindled a fire and made us all welcome because the rain was falling and the rain was cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a snake, a viper, came out because of the heat and bit him, fastened on his hand. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But Paul shook the creature, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, the people were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm came to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now in that region, there was an estate of a leading citizen on the island. His name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. That was the custom back then. On the third day, you could call him in and say, now what do you want? And it happened when the uh, father of Publius lay sick of a fever. It happened that the father of Publius laid sick with a fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to him and prayed and laid his hand on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came to be healed. And they also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as necessary. For those of you taking notes tonight, there's three things you can write down. This would be my three points. Number one, you, you are on a journey. You are on a journey. Along the way, there's going to be stopping places. Some of them you like and some of them you don't. Some of them you won't like. Many, many years ago, when I was in my first bout of college, I decided to take the bus, trailway bus, from Montgomery, Alabama to, uh, to Florida State, Tallahassee. I have taken the train in the past, I'd gone by car, but it just seemed like an adventure to take a bus and go through the back country roads to all these little towns. I thought it'd be very entertaining. After 36 hours on that bus, I decided never to take a bus trip ever again. Now, I wasn't able to stick to that because uh, the tour group that we was on involved in, in traveling at Florida State, we was on a bus all the time. But oh my goodness alive, they stopped at every little town. They, and it was not like just stop and pick up somebody and go. You stop and we're here for 30 minutes. Anybody want to get off and get something to eat? And all? I want to go to Florida. I would, and you know, oh boy. Anybody been in that kind of a trip? Does anybody feel like you're on one now? You understand what I'm saying then, okay? So that's my... <laughs> Hello. Are you hear you? <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had fun all day long. Boy, oh boy. So you are on a journey. Point number two is this. You're going to come under three kinds of attack. You will come under three kinds of attacks. My message to you, shake it off. I'll come back to that. And my third point will be simply this. The Holy Spirit will empower you to shake it off. O'Donnell Otwell did a fabulous job here Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. She left here on a spiritual high. We've talked twice since last Wednesday night, and she's still on a spiritual high. She had a prayer class the next morning at college, and when she got back to the university that morning for that 8 o'clock class, she went in there telling about what happened here on Wednesday night, and it happened all over again. God is doing some good things, 
and you and I need to recognize that no matter what you're going through, you are on a journey. God put you on a journey. God knows where you're going. God knows where you are. God knows what's going on. And the thing he wants you to recognize is you will complete your journey. Amen? Amen. How many of you made up your mind, I'm going to do what God called me to do? Amen. How many of you know what he's called you to do? How many of you feel like you've been called to preach? <laughs> wow. Can you preach for me next Sunday night? <laughs> oh, boy. All right. <laughs> hey, so here's the thing I want to do. First of all, I want you to recognize that the Apostle Paul had been arrested for something he's not guilty of. And they were trying to put, they wanted to put him to death. And he finally realized that his greatest defense was the fact that he was born a Roman citizen. And so he made the comment in the trial. He said, look, I appeal to Caesar. They said, well, only uh, Roman citizens can do that. He said, I'm a Roman citizen. The soldier asked him, he said, how did you manage to do that? I'm a Roman citizen, but I, had to, I bought it and paid for it. It was a big price. He said, oh, no, I was born that way. I was born a Roman citizen. How many of you know you have access to the throne of God? Do you know why you have access to the throne of God? You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You are a child of the king. You have a legal right to petition the throne of God for anything and everything that's going on in your life. If you're struggling tonight, I want you to demand a trial in heaven. God, this is what I'm going through. This is my situation. This is my problem. And I know who I am in Christ Jesus. And therefore, I'm claiming my victory tonight. Jesus paid the price. The victory is mine. And I've got the Holy Ghost inside of me that's telling me it's time for me to just start praising God. Even before it's manifest. Because that's the joy of the Lord. The joy unspeakable and full of glory. Everybody say, I got it. I got it. Somebody shout glory. Glory. What did you just do? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, Paul gets on this boat. And just to give you a little bit of the story previous to this, the soldiers knew that the season was changing, bad weather was on its way, cold weather, winter was coming. And they wanted to get home, and I understand that, but they're not going to make it. This storm comes up. They have to pull into this harbor, which is nothing more than a little fishing village. And in this little fishing village is nothing but a bunch of fishermen and a smell of fish. And it looked like we we're going to be stuck here. And just around the cove on that island, not too far, just around the bend, was a nightclub in town. And one day the sun came out and the weather warmed up. And the guy said, we got a break here. Let's get in the boat and go around the curve and get to that little honky-tonk town. And they take off. And no sooner had they got started, the cloud covered the sun, the temperature dropped, another storm moves in, and this time, this storm is devastating. It is called a, a python, a derocleton. It means there's absolutely no escape from it. It's a, a demon destruction type storm. And the ship is going down. There's no way they can save this boat. But they try everything they can think of to save it. The first thing they did was they began to tie cables around the boat to hold it together. I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life when I was trying to hold everything together. I could fix this problem, I could fix that problem, I could make this work, I could make that work, and nothing was saving me. I'm still sinking. The storm is overtaking me. So the next thing we do is we begin to throw stuff overboard. We begin to get stuff out of our lives, but maybe that'll make a difference if I stop doing this or stop doing that. Maybe that would make a difference. And it didn't make a difference. The storm is still taking its toll on the boat. The boat's going down. And so after a while, they all got together and decided to have a prayer meeting. And all these guys are praying to their various gods to save them. It's amazing how we try to save ourselves first 
save our situation first before we go to God. But who is our God? Let me try something on you. Don't raise your hand on this. But is there anybody around here every time you get in trouble you call mama to pray for you? Or you call grandma to pray for you? You just put mama or grandmama between you and God. Hello? Some of you look at me like, hmm, but it's true. Take mama and grandmama out of the picture. Let it be just you and God. Are you still with me? I want you to know something. God is your heavenly father. And especially with men, sometimes that can be a difficult thing if you've had a difficult father. But I want you to know your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father do whatever is necessary to make you a winner. Your heavenly father would never badmouth you. Your heavenly father will always bring the best out of you. Are you, still li- are you still listening to me? Now, you got somebody on your side. Jesus paid the price for you to win. You got somebody else on your side. You got the Holy Ghost inside of you, the Holy Spirit inside of you that's going to give you the ability to shake some of this stuff off. Are you ready to shake it off? Hallelujah. Preacher, I'm running, I'm running a fever. Shake it off. Well, I've got a lot of allergies. Shake it off. I've got an attitude. Shake it off. Hello, sir. There's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on when God gets a hold of the church. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shake. <laughs> All right. Now, so the Apostle Paul comes up on the deck and he said, Fellows, listen to me. You've been praying. I've been praying. I've been praying to my God. And my God has answered and sent an angel. Said everything's going to be all right. You know, we need people in our midst that have come out in the midst of a situation like that and remind us everything's going to be all right. Preacher, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Everything's going to be all right. Preacher, I don't have an answer to this. Everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah. Some of you are already smiling. Everything's going to be all right. Look at somebody and say, everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He said, now, you haven't been eating, you've been fasting and praying to your God. Let's all eat. Let's get something out and eat so we can feel better. We're going to land on an island. We're all going to be saved. Ship's going to be lost. I'm glad my old life ship sank. There's nothing left of that old boat. I got a new ship now. It's called a gospel ship. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus is my life. They landed on this island in the midst of all this rain and storm and cold weather. And the islanders came out and did something very interesting. They asked no questions, but they provided a place of comfort for them. That meant also building some lean tos if the lean tos were not already there, and building a bonfire to get some heat going. And then after that, they're going to eat. They're taking good care of these guys, and they go beyond that. They even after the storm had uh, subsided, for the next three days, they take good care of these guys. And I want you to understand, it was customary in those days to do that. If you had a stranger come to your house, you entertained them for three days, on the third day you had a right to call them in and say, okay, now, why are you here and what do you want? That's the, that was the custom, okay? But the interesting thing is this. The Apostle Paul wanted to be a part of what everybody's doing, rightly so, and so they're getting ready to build this big bonfire, so everybody's going out and gathering scrap wood to throw on the fire, and he's out there gathering branches or, trim or limbs or whatever, to throw on the fire, and it's cold weather, that meant that there was a snake in his wood that was in hibernation, and when we got to the fire and started putting the wood on the fire, 
the, uh, hiber the snake began to warm up a cold-blooded creature, and he comes out of a state of hibernation, and Paul is throwing this wood on the fire, and he throws the snake like this, and the snake just holds onto his hand. And so there Paul stands with this long snake hanging down. And everybody's looking at him and saying, uh-huh. Yep. You're a bad dude. You're a bad dude. You escaped the sea. But God's got your number. You're going to die. There's not a person in this room that's been called to die from snake bite. Translation, there's not a person in this room that's been called to die at the devil's hands. I don't care what kind of a devil got a hold of you. You're on a journey. You're on a journey that's going to wind up at the portal gates of heaven. You're on a journey that's going to take you into the big banquet room of heaven. And there in that big banquet hall, tables are set up, chairs are set up, and at each chair there's a name tag. One of them says Jim Harden. Amen? How many of you made your reservation? You're on a journey. You're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going to a celebration. So, folk, no matter what's going on, I don't care what bit you, I don't care what got a hold of you, shake it off. Come on, guys, shake it off. Well, I've tried to shake it off, and it won't fall off. Yes, it will. Oh, it'll shake off, I promise you. The only thing that won't shake off is the thing that you're not ready, ready to let go of. Hello. I told you this story. I know I've told it a couple of times about the rattlesnake that I hit with a hatchet and took back to camp holding it like this. How many of you remember that story? The snake had just come out of hibernation. It was spring and I had the boys with me. We were out on the camp out and we were having a hike before breakfast. The guys were back cooking breakfast. I took the guys out on a hike. Coming back, I see this rattlesnake up on a stump. And so I take my hatchet and I hit him because I like to put things like that in formaldehyde when I'm on a trip and I can show it to the boys. The boys get, ooh, look at that frog, you know. Uh, snake, turtle, whatever, you know, it didn't matter. Lizards, I did it all. But um, I pick up this snake and I'm holding it by the nap of the neck and out like this, it dragged the ground. It's a nice rattlesnake. And the boys are walking along with me, and I'm holding like I'm a champion, you know, a big, tough dude here. And all these boys are walking up to it, poking it, and all, they're making comments and asking me questions and everything. And all of a sudden, I noticed that the snake wasn't still anymore. It was doing this. I had knocked it out. I hadn't killed it. By the time we got back to camp, that snake was wrapped around my arm. I don't like snakes, by the way. Just want you to know that. I wasn't feeling like a champion. I wasn't feeling very brave, but I had to put on a front for those boys. You understand what I'm saying? So my, my pocket knife had an, a pick, ice pick uh, blade on it. And so I pulled it out and had one of the boys open it up. And I went to the campfire. You know what a backlog is on a campfire, I hope. I went to the backlog on the campfire and I turned that snake around so that I could get him right here. And I took my knife and I <laughs> pinned him and shook him loose. Now, why did I tell that again? I want you to know something. The old devil got a hold of us. But Jesus, at the cross, pinned him to the backlog. You're free. You're free. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm free. Do you really believe you're free? 
Do you really, really believe that you're free? You're not one of those people you're putting on the front and six months from now you're going to go back to picking up some of your old habits. Six months from now or six years from now. How many of you are going to be true to God from now until Jesus calls you home? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I told you my second point was a threefold attack. Let me give you all three of them. Discouragement, criticism, and low expectations. Discouragement. When you're on a journey, and the journey you're on tonight is to your heavenly home. It's going to take you up hills and down hills, mountains and valleys, deserts and streams. Sometimes you're going to run into things that are not pleasant. And you're going to run into people that's not pleasant. If your focus is on things and people, you can get discouraged. I need to say that again. If your focus is on things, situations, and people, you can be discouraged. But if your focus is on the goal, your focus is on who is at the goal post, you're going to celebrate your victory. I've got a peace tonight that the world didn't give to me. And the world can't take it away from me. I have a victory tonight that people did not give me. And people can't take it away from me. Are you listening to me? So when that element of discouragement comes, remember it is an attack on the mind, it's not on your spirit. It's an attack on your mind. Renew your mind with the promises, the word of God. Renew your mind with the bread of life. Renew your mind. I'm telling you, this works. Hello. I, I, you know, I know a lot of people preach from laptops and cell phones. That's okay for them. It's not okay for me. I like the book. I like my Bible. I'm telling you, I like my Bible. I've got notes all over my Bible. I can't put these kind of notes in my cell phone. You understand what I'm talking about? And every time I open my Bible, I look at that. Oh, I see that again. Yeah, it reminds me. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? Are you blessed? I'm telling you what, if I got to get you cranked up, how many people here are blessed? <laughs> so that means you're not going to get discouraged, right? Shake it off. Shake it off. <laughs> I like you. You know, the whole thing is this you're on a journey. You're on a journey. As I mentioned a moment ago, you're going up hills and down hills and rivers and valleys and all that. You're going to come across situations that are not nice. And it's usually people and things. Shake it off. Do not be discouraged. My second one is this. Criticism. Criticism. You know, Jesus could never do anything right. He went to church or the synagogue. And there's a man there with a withered hand. And the religious guys are there looking at Jesus and whispering to each other. This Jesus fellow's been out there healing people. But this is the Sabbath. We don't work on the Sabbath. Do you think Jesus is going to heal anybody in, here in the church, the synagogue today, on the Sabbath? Jesus knew in his spirit what they were saying. He said, is it right 
to do a good thing and wrong not to do a good thing. If you have an opportunity to do something good, should you do it? And he could see the resentment building up. He knew, they knew exactly where Jesus would go and he knew exactly what they were thinking. So he said to the man with the withered arm, stand up. The man stood up. He said, stretch that hand out. Now, folk, listen. I don't know how long that man had walked around with a withered hand. But I can assure you that there had been many times when he tried his best to stretch it out. He may have even had a daily routine every morning thinking maybe if I exercise it, I can make it work. And so many times we do that with our testimony and our ministry. The hand of our ministry, the hand of our testimony. We don't feel like we have a ministry. We don't feel like we have a testimony. And we keep thinking, well, if we keep working this, maybe one of these days I'll, make a, uh, I'll be a good Bible teacher. Uh, keep doing this. Maybe I can overcome my weaknesses. You know, we'll keep exercising. It's called self-works. Hello? What made the difference in that man so that he could stretch forth his hand simply because Jesus told him to. How is it possible that this man whose hand is useless has no strength or power, all of a sudden, boom, there it is. Is it because Jesus said so? I want you to know something. When Jesus, the Word, and the Holy Spirit come together, you've got the power of God, and nothing shall be impossible to him who believes. What God has done for one person, he'll do for everybody. If he has blessed anybody in this room, he'll bless everybody in this room. If he has set one person free, he'll set everybody free. All you have to do is not look at the negative. Hello? Now, this is criticism here. The criticism is something like this. That snake bit Paul. They begin to criticize him. Uh-huh. He's a criminal. He should have died on that storm. But he got escaped, and now he's going to get it anyway. No, no. Criticism will come and go. Hello? I've been criticized for some of my sermons. Only to have somebody come back years later and tell me I was right. I wish I could say I've never been wrong, but... Well, I can say it. Nobody's going to believe it, right? <laughs> but the whole, the whole deal is this. Are you for real? I don't mean if you're a dynamic Christian or a wimpy Christian. I just asked you one question. Do you love God? Can you prove it? Whatever you confess, be ready to back it up with proof. My life, my testimony, whatever it is, back it up with proof. Am I doing okay? Now, I want to use another illustration here. Remember that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist, his brother, I mean his cousin, had been told that when you see the Holy Spirit descending on someone and remaining in that person, you're looking at the Messiah. And so John the Baptist is out there preaching and baptizing, and here comes his first cousin, Jesus. Jesus comes up and says, John, I need you to baptize me. John says, oh, no, 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 I need to be baptized by you. Because he'd heard about Jesus. 
But here's the thing that's so interesting about that. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? You and I were baptized in water as an act of repentance and a testimony that we've been born again, right? Jesus hadn't committed any sins and he didn't need to be born again. So why in the world did Jesus say, I need to be baptized? Because he was the Lamb of God, scheduled for sacrifice. When they brought the lambs in, in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, under the law, to be, uh, to be sacrificed, they had to wash them. So Jesus comes in and says, wash me. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes. You that have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, some of you Wednesday night, some of you at camp, some of you 10 years ago, some of you a long, long, long time ago. You have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with fire. And the fire always showed up, and this is from this morning's message, the fire always shows up as a mark of God's approval. And I used the illustration this morning of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Elijah got the prophets of Baal together and he said, you guys build an altar and I'll build an altar and we'll both build altars just alike. You offer a sacrifice, I'll offer a sacrifice. You pray to your gods and I'll pray to my God. And the God that answered by fire is the God we're gonna serve. Here's a man that's ready to change a nation. Folks, you and I have the ability to change our home, our family, our church, our community. We have the ability to change the nation. And it has to do with our relationship with God. I'm coming up to a key word. You want to give, I'll give you a key word to write down. Approval. Approval. Now the prophets of Baal built their altar. They set a fire around their altar. They sacrificed the animal and put it on the altar and nothing is happening. So they begin to pray and pray and pray and nothing is happening. So they begin to dance around it and nothing is happening. They begin to shout and nothing is happening. And finally, they jump up on the altar and offer themselves and they're getting burned. They're cutting themselves with knives and bleeding all over the place and nothing is happening. And this goes on for six hours from nine o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon. Three o'clock was the time of the evening sacrifice to the Jew. Elijah got the match in his hand and said, before I set this wood on fire, let's put about 30 gallons of water on this thing. So they begin to pour water on it. They dug a trench around it. The water's going over the wood, soaking it running down in the ditch that's around the altar. How many of you know you have an altar in your heart? How many of you know Jesus is on that altar? But he's alive, amen. You and I need to dig a ditch around our lives. Keep the world on that side, God on this side. You understand what I'm saying? S separate yourself from the things of the world. Separate yourself. Now, having said that, after all the water's been poured on there, Elijah prays a prayer of 64 words. Not a long prayer, 64 words is all he prayed. And fire from heaven fell on that altar. The fire of approval. You received the Holy Spirit the other night. You received the Holy Spirit at Camp Lake Leakey. You received the Holy Spirit whenever. I want you to know something. You received the fire of God as well. John told his disciples, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit 
and fire. The Holy Spirit is power. Fire is approval. On the day of Pentecost, in the upper room, 120 received the Holy Spirit with tongues of fire. They received power and approval. I want you to know something tonight. You have received power and you have received God's approval. You're on a journey. The devil can't stop you. People can't stop you. Circumstances can't stop you. Once in a while, something slows me down. But I know in whom I have believed, I'm fully persuaded he is able. I'm going to win this game. I know I'm going to win this game. Everybody say, I'm a winner. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a winner. There is no losers in this room tonight. I really want you to get a handle on that. I really want you to get it. There are no losers in this place. Hallelujah. So I close with this. The Holy Spirit empowers you to shake it off. Go with me to, if you have your Bibles handy, go with me to John 10.10, 10, one of my favorite verses. You could probably be quoted, but I want you to underline it in your Bible. Are you there? The thief, that old devil, does not come except to steal to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have life more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life to the sheep. The devil comes to kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He comes to steal your spiritual life. He comes to kill you physically. And he comes to destroy your creativity. How many of you are dreamers? Anybody here want to classify themselves as a dreamer? I'm a dreamer. How many of you have, have some big dreams? How many of you have dreams you don't think are possible? How many of you know that God gives us dreams and visions? And how many of you know if God gives it to us, it's possible? Amen? Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Stand with me all over the room. Come on down front with me as we always do on Sunday night. Shout to all the people.